I think I'll go ahead and just open it up to the floor first and see if anyone, if you raise your hand, we'll have a mic sent over to you if anyone wants to start. Otherwise, I have a couple of questions. I will break the ice. Oh, you see someone? Oh, OK. Run, run. <laughs> 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 So I wanted to ask about the last uh, the closing remark about uh, students being limited by technology. Um, um, I wonder if you can elaborate on that because in my experience and for, from what I've seen, I think that um, in my limited experience, of course, that teachers are more limited by technology than students. And the students might have more digital literacy and experience with technology than the teacher. Uh, so can you probably just elaborate on how we, how we are intimidated by technology and how we just can help them? Well, that's actually, I don't know Press if this is Press the little thing. Oh. oh. Okay. Oh, I see one more passing it from you. Okay. That's actually why I, can you hear yeah. with this? Okay. That's actually why I put students might not, and then in parentheses, <laughs> or might be intimidated, right? Because they most likely will not be intimidated, right, by these new technologies. But the real point is whether or not they're intimidated or they think they're great, they will already think they know everything about them, right? And we know that no single person knows everything about all of the new tools and spaces. That, that's really why I wanted to mention it. Because even, even if they think they're experts or they love it, they can always try to use it for in a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will say from studying children, like there's this idea that kids are digital natives. But if you actually look at the research, um, Esker Hargitay of uh, Northwestern has this great article, Digital Natives, but the T is in parentheses. So it's really more like digital naives, right? If you look at who participates on the web in the ways that we like to celebrate, right? Who's really being productive about things, who's taking advantage, who really knows how to sort through and evaluate the reliability or make sense of advertisements and the information you're giving away, very, very few people do. So I'm just very careful of that idea that kids or adults or our students actually are sophisticated about the ways that they might use uh, digital sources and tools. Mm -hmm. That's why I decided to focus on whether or not they're intimidated by them. Yes. Because they're usually smart. not as intimidated <laughs> as I would be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. My question is for uh, Dr. Lola. You mentioned in your presentation uh, that you use Camtasia as a research tool. I was wondering how you use that. Um, is, it, is it on? Can you hear me? And what it is? <laughs> Camtasia is a, um, it's a screen, I mean, it's a, it can capture the, the computer screen. So basically, it records everything that the person is doing in the computer. So for writing purposes, this is very interesting because then we can figure it out. I mean, we can look at the text when it's produced and we can analyze it and you know, do some analysis on the test, the discourse. But if you want to know how they're actually writing, you know, that's how we've been using Camtasia. So it records everything that is happening in the, um, at the, at the pra when, as I say, when composing. So we were able to do different analysis some analysis have been for time allocation, so we were able to see where, how much time it would take them, for example, to write a sentence, or where, how many pauses they would have between the sentences. Uh, sometimes they were at the limit of the clause. So we had a sense of what was going on while they were composing. Or sometimes they were just, look, you know, you could see the, um, how they were pausing, and then how they were moving, you know, the, the mouse and see that they were going back like four lines you know above and revise where they were doing there and then going back again and writing and so on so we've been using it for time allocation and also to see what type of revisions and how they were revising for example 
So, I mean, we had a sense that sometimes that when, they, you know, when they are writing, they have an idea in mind, and then they pause, go back, and change it, or they continue. So, um, we know that writing is not a li linear process, but I mean, if, if you see how they, the students are composing, do you realize how difficult and complex it is for them to write? And how um, we've also used it for seeing how they were understanding feedback. And it takes sometimes forever for them to understand the feedback that you think is very clear. And so they, you know, it's some things that are very clear, they, it takes them like 20 minutes to correct. And other, uh, you know, in other instances, it might be a few seconds. So that's how I've been using Camtasia for writing processes. And then it has a very nice feature. Um, I haven't used it yet, but it's, um, you can, I mean, you can use it as stimulus recall protocol. And then you can see with the student a video of what was going on, I mean, of, of what was happening when the person was composing. And then you can ask questions and everything will be recorded as well. So it's, it's a nice um, tool for research, I would say. But I mean, you can use Camtasia for many other things, even for class, teaching classes and, and other matters. I myself, I use it to give my students feedback. Yeah. And so they will start writing and take a screenshot of it. Mm -hmm. Then I would use it to, to write the feedback on using Camtasia and send them the feedback. Yeah. They find it very helpful and useful. Yeah. Because you can be elaborate on your feedback more than you could be on a piece of paper and write your feedback in, uh, mm -hmm. using a pen. Yeah. So you can say something mm -hmm. and write and like write it or write it on more candidates and then they can see what mm -hmm. it. What is being learned more and more is that through multimodality types of feedback we are being able to reach the students better than before. Because it's true that sometimes what we write is not completely comprehensible or to the students, so the, the mix of uh, integrating maybe writing and you know some oral feedback is more helpful. But I don't know. There is someone else that is going to. No. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, yeah, I think it goes back to the first question that we have this idea that the students are very familiarized with, you know, social tools. And so what happens is when you use them for educational purposes, they, they, are, they are lost. I mean, if you place them in front of a computer and you say, well, write uh, in this blog, they can just go really fast, but they don't have a, an understanding of why they're doing it. And so um, I think that's what I was, I was mentioning before, this idea of the task-based approach in a way. Because if you kind of sequence all the faces and you give them time to play, sometimes with, with the tools, and then not evaluate everything that they are doing, because I think the first time they were, you know, when they were using the wiki, you know, it's a, it's a, new, um, it's a new software that they have to be familiarized with. You know, at the beginning, we were not evaluating any of that. I mean, we're just letting them play with it, which I think is something that um, David was saying. We have a, a fear of playing with things and, and playing with our students. And sometimes those moments are more educational than anything else. So yeah, that's what, what we were doing. I mean, it was first uh, the wikis. I think that the digital story, the iMovie, was the hardest thing to, to handle. Uh, the first time that we did it, it you know, we saw some of the, the problems that they had. So by the second time that we tried it on, we started from the beginning of the semester working towards the digital story. So it was very slowly done. And even though there were some people that they asked, I mean, they already told us that they were not technology people. I mean, they were all able to manage to the digital story. I mean, there were others that were more creative, but obviously, everybody felt that at the end they have all accomplished that. But I think that playing and, and, and game, like we have a tendency not to do with language, 
and that's something that we lose when we were from where we were kids. I think that's something that we have to incorporate. Did I answer your question? Did you say something? Did you say something? Okay. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Fields um, uh, regarding uh, cheating. Yeah. Um, it seemed to me that there was some distinction. Well, I'm curious about the distinctions, I suppose, uh, that you draw between cheating and strategizing, mm -hmm. because it seemed to me that a lot of the um, well, maybe not a lot, but at least some of the examples I thought of as being good learning strategies that I would present if I were teaching something like that. Like, oh, here's a good learning strategy. Um, or is that just really synonymous with cheating in the literature? I don't know. Um, but it seems like there's a stigma to cheating that isn't with strategies. Thank you. And is that important at all or not? Yeah, well, I think that was my point, was that um, so there's not a lot of literature on cheating. It's, you know, but, um, but some, some uh, game designers will write about that and even intentionally design their games to support certain kinds of cheating. And then of course you have to be aware of all the ways that people will try to break your game in ways that maybe you don't want. Um, so some cheats are definitely strategizing. Um, I've had some people say, well, that's just like, like meta learning, right? You're just sort of thinking about the overarching, okay? Mm -hmm. I, and some people, um, I had a question not long ago, I was like, well, why are you calling it cheating? I'm like, well, I, I call it cheating because that's the word the kids use in their play cultures, right, in gaming. So getting a tip or having someone say, when you get to this level, you go walk to this guy, you ask this person a question, you go hide behind that thing, and then you go get this, and you do this, and you do it in order, right? Well, that's known as a cheat because you didn't figure it out all by yourself or something like that. And so I think, you know, in, um, in a lot of education, we tend to, and our assessments tend to value just individual achievement. And there's this idea that I think we need to disrupt that you have to do it all by yourself and that's the real honest, you know, you write that essay all 100% by yourself. Well, I promise you that's not the way I do it as an academic, right? I write parts, I get friends to co-author with me, or I trade papers with them, and they tell me everything that's not working, and then I fix it, and then they, oh, what, they'll tell me what literature to look at. In fact, reviewers will tell you what literature to look at. You know, it's a very collaborative process, and we often don't illuminate that for kids. And so, you know, you can call it whatever you want. Um, I call it cheating because it usually disrupts people's ideas of like, oh my gosh, she's telling us to cheat, right? So there's a bit of that strategy. Um, and then also because, um, you know, a large majority of kids are fairly familiar with video games and the ones who play somewhat substantially are, are familiar with the idea that there might be a cheat for the game or a special little hidden Easter egg or something like that. So I hope that ends. Did I get your question? Halfway? Yeah. Okay. About, I mean, I understand the provocative nature yep. of using the word cheating. That has a, a certain power in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I think as grad students, we all, I don't know if I would call it cheating. No, I don't, I don't always, right? But it does help me think about the design of my courses. Um, and so sometimes, you know, I guess in my learning theory class, I haven't used the idea of cheating with them quite yet, but I am encouraging them to value the process over just a final product by the way that I grade. Um, I, you know, have other things that help with that kind of strategizing that, you know, very intentionally go ask your friends for help or go find another student who's been here a year longer than you and find out from them what their strategies were, you know, that's a, just smart. And so, um, so yeah. So this is actually related. Um, and so when I hear you talking about cheating, and then I think about when we learn about teaching, and then the elephant in the room, I think is online translation and translators and technologies that are making it easier and easier for us to be uh, you know, develop what seems to be fluent complexity in our language use yet. We are mediated and supported by these tools constantly. 
So I'm just wondering if you can think about um, or have any consent or anybody, uh, you know, do you allow the use of online translators, for example, or any kind of translation technology? Is that kind of a new literacy? Mm -hmm. Think about that. Uh, many people just sort of, I think, ignore. I don't teach foreign languages, so online translators pretty much never come up in my teaching that I'm aware of, unless it's someone finding another website and then I use them. Um, but what it made me think of was calculators and math. Um, I'm not sure if that's like a really great analogy, but I think that's one of the things where you have to help students think about, you know, all right, let's just be honest, let's talk about it, right? and have them talk about when is an online translator useful, right? When does it speed something up? What kinds of knowledge do you need when you might not be able to use an online translator, right? Um, what kind of mistakes do they make? When is that funny? Um, you know, like with calculators and math education, right, that's a big deal. And a lot of people would say, well, arithmetic and multiplication tables aren't real math, right? But I think you do get into major problems when people don't actually have enough number understanding to understand why you would carry the one. That's a particular invention that we've made. It speeds up some things, but if they don't understand ones and tens places, then you have, then you have problems. Like, college and you know just everyday life and so there's this what do you need to understand you know and it, I think it's really getting learners to think about about that themselves and why not have them my idea is just to have them debate it since it's an obvious tool it's there and you might even think about it how will your professor know whether you've used this or not right <laughs> have them think and then, then that they have to analyze you know, the output, because I, I mean, I guarantee I used it on enough web pages that I know the online translators make a heck of a lot of very interesting mistakes that I obviously have to, you know, like, no, I don't, I don't think that's what they meant. So, um, yeah. Well, on the um, first day of class, I usually show them how to use the library's website to find articles or books. And then the example I used is an article I wrote on the use of web-based machine translation for language learning, in which it says, you know, it kind of gives examples of all of the problems. It um, gives some strategies for teachers who want to discuss it with their students at the beginning of the semester. And I just encourage them to use it, but to put the reference there, you know, like the, the t date and time when they used it for their composition, and they're responsible for all of the errors. Uh, the, so, of course, they know that there will be errors. They have to do a lot of work to figure out what they will be in the first place and how to fix them. So that's a different kind of work that someone is doing who's not using the translator, but if they're doing something, then oops. I was just going to say, too, we were talking about what's the cheating being a reappropriation by gamers by this generation of a term of a recent indication of it. It's very nuanced. It's very specific. And it could actually change what we think of. And there's these things we're looking at as collaborative advantage mm. and not in malicious terms, mm -hmm. which would exclude it from being used in negative and dishonest ways. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, so well, so. well, if you. <laughs> so, in uh, Rules of Play by Zimmerman and Salen, which is really for game designers or students learning to become game designers, they have an outline of cheats. And, and we, use, we, we borrow that and try to apply it to Wyville. And some of them are Easter eggs, right? Little hidden treasures that the designers actually build and they want you to find. And then some of them are like, you know, type in a code or get a walkthrough. And then there's the uh, things that ruin it for other players, like really like digging into the code of the game, right? Or playing a game, especially in a multiplayer game, playing in a way that really disrupts the social dynamics. And um, so then, then that becomes problematic. And you know, I've seen kids do it all. But it's interesting, when you're playing a game, if you use too many cheats, the game becomes very boring. Okay? Because you, I don't know, part of the fun of the game is the challenge. Mm -hmm. Learning, this is one of the ideas of, of people like Jim G who study video games. Video games, if they're good, design well for learning. So it's that learning in itself is the fun part. It's what gives you a buzz. So, um, which is really funny to think about. Um, 
And so it's, it's thinking about when do you use cheats? You know, how are you going to use them selectively? And those sorts of things. Um, partly, I'm not sure if it's exactly. So yes, kids are, people, players are aware of that. And I think you can read more about that from some people who have studied cheating even more than I have. Um, and then going back to John's question, one of the things about the online translator that made me think about it is, um, you know, like this summer I taught three uh, summer camps for kids where they spent 30 hours learning how to computer program. And one of the things we did like halfway, like the second half was learn how to make video games. And the first thing we did is it's actually really hard. You have to get into variables and some abstract stuff. And these are like, you know, 10 to 12 year olds. And so that's, that's kind of new for that age. And they, um, so we gave them games and we had them cheat the game by going into the code and changing things. And so we used that as, well, go find that health variable, right? We had to introduce them to variables. We just had to go, they found it. And then they're like, oh, this raises my health by one every time I do this, or it lowers it. I'm just going to change that number, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a great way to get them into it. And then, of course, they're like, well, now the game's boring. And I'm like, okay, how would you design more challenge into the game then? And so that... It just made me think of the online translator and really unpacking that as a human designed tool. And then, you know, there you have a lens on what are the weaknesses and, and, uh, and how that tool works. Um, so, I, I actually have, a, I have an anecdote um, kind of related to the cheating and then I had a question that was for all three of you. And that was uh, in a fifth semester German course where we were doing a gaming unit. So this is in a German language class um, with Christine Lange and Diane Richardson who are here. And so we were assigning the students to play digital games, existing digital games in German. And one of the students who started out very grumpy about this assignment because he is not a gamer, um, <laughs> hacked into the game and managed to find, try to hack into the game so that it would play for him and he didn't have to do his homework and play the game. <laughs> <laughs> And, but what was brilliant about it was that then he found himself in a situation where in order to get back into the system, he had to navigate his way through German legalese and all of the restrictions. And so he found himself in a really, kind of a really interesting, immersive, yeah. critical incident kind of moment um, that he had to reflect on and had to kind of fess up about, um, but it became interesting. So, um, so kind of related to, to that, I noticed, um, Adoya used the phrase the different cultures of literacy that are emerging. Mm -hmm. And I heard that in all of the talks in some way or another, that there are different rules of the game, that there are different designs that we're drawing from and forms of interaction, different, mm -hmm. different processes, different practices. Um, and it, some of what I feel like the discussion is pointing out is this is kind of pushing back on our educational culture, that these different cultures of literacy that we necessarily have to take stock of them, not just as objects of instruction um, or kind of ways in, but that they're actually pushing back. So I was wondering if, if any of you could say a little bit about how you see that pushing back on what educational culture is. <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> in, in what ways are these different cultures of literacy put, kind of put, forcing us to reconsider what the assumptions we make about educational culture, about what we do in the classroom, mm -hmm. how we assess what we I think count the, as cheating? I think the hard part about all of this is how far can I go in my department? Yeah. Right? Because that, that's the reality of anything that's new or that seems new, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we, we might not think of a lot of this as even particularly new, mm -hmm. but walk around my department and it's as if I'm, you know, proposing some kind of wild uh, educational program mm -hmm. that involves all of this new stuff. And if they don't, if colleagues don't understand it, then they can't be receptive to it, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, for me, it's more of a practical, the practical limitations of a lot of this. Mm -hmm. right. No? <laughs> yeah. I think that for, I mean, I think that when I was talking about this writing, you know, uh, second language writing, I think that is, I mean, we've been consumed with, what, three, four genres that we teach in the class. You know, and you know, lower level we manage or master description, mm -hmm. and then we move to narration, and then advanced argumentation and exposition. And so, I'm not saying that this is wrong because I think that um, when we did a need analysis um, with uh, the students that are going to be either going to the job market or they're going to do some graduate courses afterwards, they they really needed it, and that's why you you don't completely erase them from the the curriculum. But there are also other um, acts of writing that they can be, you know, as efficient as, as what we've been using in the past, in which they are more engaged 
and I think that the, the issue, I mean, they don't like to write in their first language. They don't. I mean, you ask them and they don't like to write it. And when you ask them, are you a good writer, most of the times they said either, yes, oh, I'm a perfect writer, and then you read what they've written in English and you're like, oh. So there's like this either denial or lack of reality. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And then we're pushing them to write in a second language, which is even harder. You know, they don't have the vocabulary, the structures, the syntactical structures are different. So I think that being able to use you know, like the digital story, it gives them a sense of, I mean, we're still using narration, because we were, but we were using a sense of orality, which is part of our world nowadays. I mean, we go from writing to speaking to uh, mixing languages. I mean, it's like, this is, this is really changing. So I think that it's true that we need to change that in our curriculum. But I know, I, I, I agree with you in the sense that sometimes when you talk to colleagues, they, they don't really want to be part of that. But I think it's going to change us, whether we want it or not. It was the same as the use of computers. How many of us had colleagues that refused to use a computer? And now we are all using computers. So I think it's, it's a process. But I think that it's true that we have to talk about it and uh, move it to educational areas, probably. Yeah. I don't know if I answered. I think I just reiterated it. the I same thing. Oh, yeah. How many do we have? <laughs> so many ideas exploded into my head that I'm not sure I'm going to unpack any one of them very well. Um, the, the first thing that came to mind, and it partly relates to um, Ilola's, um, you know, using digital stories and the idea that they went deeper mm -hmm. into certain areas, you know, because of their the audience and what yeah. they were preparing, and I would say the personal relevance of yeah. what they were saying, yeah. Yeah. because they were also probably telling a story that was interesting or maybe important to them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I study and really the undergirding thing that drives me in my research is trying to help people make connections across spaces. You know, because we have such divisions between home, family, friends, hobbies, and you can think of all of the different literacies or discourses that are a part of, of, of those, um, and say institutional settings like school. And, um, and then of course you can even talk about all the different genres of writing and science and in, in language arts and in literature courses and those sorts of things. Um, one of the things that I found really successful, I, I followed a couple of sixth grade kids um, throughout their lives for 200 hours for a year. This was my dissertation. And um, one of the things I loved was their, their um, language arts class, which was all English, so you know it's not second language learning, but um, the kids throughout writing that whole year were encouraged to find the writer in them and to apply it to whatever genre of thing they were doing. And what this did is it gave them permission um, and encouragement to take their personality and figure out how to put their personality in everything from a, a, a narrative to a poem to an argumentative essay. I even watched kids write a, a, an argumentative science piece on why leaves are smaller where it's hotter and those sorts of things. And they inserted a sense of humor into it. So they grabbed onto this identity of being a writer even as they were applying it across different genres. And, um, and then the, the Lawrence's comment about, about departments, I think it's, you know, a lot of departments, we, we decide this is what counts as the real Thing. Like, this means you've learned something, right? And it's so funny, I, I work a lot with computer science, and computer scientists have like, it's good if it's abstract, it's top down, it's well planned, whatever. And then they want to broaden participation in computer science. I was like, well, you can't broaden participation without changing what you do. And so a lot of the stuff that I do is like, well, we're going to start with light up clothes and programming lights to blink, and it's very ground up, but they're learning difficult programming as they do it, only it doesn't look the way you, you yeah, think it ought to look. And so it's, it's valuing different kind of epistemologies of top down, ground up. Um, it, it strikes me that as you get into different literacies, that's one of those things, um, the, the authentic audience, mm -hmm. right? And I think one thing is like helping students realize, okay, you can reach one audience with this, right? You want to work in the echelons of power, you have to be able to talk in the super academic E, whatever that is for this particular discipline way. Um, and yet, we also think it's important for you to translate it to this other way. I know as an academic, I've had to grow a lot in my ability, which is pretty poor, to speak to like broad audiences or to write a, you know, a single paragraph that, about my thing that can, the newspaper can pick up and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. It's a different kind of writing that I would benefit from learning. 
Well, thank you. At this point, it is 12, which means that it's lunchtime. So we're going to break until 1.30, and then we'll reconvene here for a discussion of the state of the field and then for our keynote speech by Richard Kern. Please join me in thanking our speakers one more time for this interesting and exciting, wonderful <laughs> round table discussion. Thank you. Thank you.